Hello, I'm Federico Campagna, and it's a pleasure to be here as part of the public program for the exhibition of Damla Kilikiran. It's a real pleasure for me to be part of this art exhibition, and of course it's also a little bit strange, because I'm not an artist or an art historian or a critic. I am a writer, and I write on philosophy. More specifically, I write on metaphysics. Of course, just by saying the word metaphysics, it sounds like I'm working on something that is very remote, not only from the arts, but also from life in general. It sounds like a very academic pursuit, like a specialistic field, an abstract inquiry. But to begin my contribution to this public program, I would like to start by contending that, in fact, working on philosophy and also metaphysics is something that is very close to the arts, but also to the very heart of life. How can this be? Well, we have to begin by looking at the origin of philosophy. A small disclaimer here. Of course, philosophy is a word that we borrow from Greek. And so when I'm referring to philosophy using this term, I'm referring specifically to the tradition that derives from Greek philosophy. There are, of course, many other traditions around the world that do something similar or equivalent to philosophy. But since they use another term to define themselves, let's remain for a moment in Greece. And let's look at the origin of philosophy in ancient Greece. Already in antiquity, thinkers were asking themselves how come that they were doing something like philosophy, what it was for, and what kind of need it looked after. And they came up with an answer. Aristotle in particular suggested that the pursuit of philosophy is something that doesn't come from anything abstract, but it comes from life. Even more specifically, it comes from a feeling, from a sentiment that every sentient being has in the very experience of being alive. This feeling he described with a Greek term that doesn't have a real equivalent, neither in English nor in Italian nor in many other European languages. Thauma. Thauma is a strange term. It has to do, at the same time, with the experience of awe and amazement and the experience of terror and horror. So it's something maybe a little bit close to the idea of the sublime for the Romantics. But it's also much less pompous than the sublime. Thauma is a normal emotion. It can arise in many situations, of course, when you look at, for example, somebody you love very much and at the same time you are amazed by them, by the very fact that they are there. And you're also horrified by the incredible emotional power they have on you. But also Thauma, and the Thauma specifically to which Aristotle referred, is a feeling that comes not when you look at anything special, a special person, for example, but simply when you look around. When you look around in this room, when you look at yourself in the morning, you might be struck by the understanding that you exist and that the world around yourself seems at least to exist. And that for this existence, we don't have any explanation. There is no meaning no reason for the fact that we are here. When we investigate the fact that things are, we somehow arrive to a point when our reasoning ends and our words end. And beyond that, there is only Thauma, the amazing experience of realizing that we exist, that there is such a thing as existence. The question immediately arises, why is there something rather than nothing? This is the first reaction to this thauma towards existence. And this question, why is there something rather than nothing, is the heart of philosophy, specifically of metaphysics. This was the definition that was given of this question by Martin Heidegger, a 20th century philosopher and metaphysician. Why is there something rather than nothing? Thauma. But thauma is not just this pure feeling of contemplation. It is, in part, of course, what arises when you look around, when you do theory, because for the Greeks, to contemplate is to do theoria, contemplation, hence theory. But it's a much more embodied feeling than this. You look around, you look at yourself, you look at objects around yourself, at people around yourself, you're amazed at the fact that there is such a thing as existence rather than nothing. And then you notice 
the things change. You notice that the loved ones come into existence and die, that objects seem to vanish, that every moment in time seems to fall into nothingness, that you yourself are changing. Of the boy that I once was, not a single cell remains. Nothing of that boy remains in me. He is dead, and I am alive, and I am not the same thing, and I will soon be dead, and a new person will come, and it will still be me, but how? So you see, we are fleshing out a little bit the consequences of this feeling, of this thaura. First they lead to the inquiry of philosophy, and then they specialize in the different branches of philosophy. By observing how things change around yourself, you might want to start investigating how they change. Is there a regularity in the rhythm with which things change? Is there a particular rule in their movement? Can we measure this movement? And so on and so forth. Are there laws that describe how things interact with each other, influence and change each other? If we follow this line of inquiry, we remain within philosophy, at least in antiquity. We do what we call today natural science, and what in antiquity was simply philosophy, one lie. For example, ideas such as the idea of that atoms exist, atomism, was developed as part of a philosophical school. It was not a separate scientific inquiry. This is one possible line. But there is also another possible line, another way of questioning this experience. And once again, it has to do with Thauma. We are amazed that there is something rather than nothing. We are horrified at the fact that we're being thrown into this life. The Greeks in particular were quite pessimistic about it. There is a famous proverb uh, that Silenus gave to King Midas saying that the very best thing is to have never been born, the second best thing is to die immediately after you're born. But also we are horrified by looking at how things change and disintegrate and seemingly fall into nothingness. And at this point, the second line of inquiry that starts from this feeling is has something rebellious to it. And this is where metaphysics comes from. We don't accept this horror. We don't accept the horror of, of the idea of nothingness, the possibility that this miracle, that things exist, can somehow be turned around and destroyed and sink into an abyss of nothingness. And then we start questioning. When we see things change, do they really change? When we see time passing, does it really pass? Does such a thing as time, for example, exist? When I see myself as a young boy becoming an adult and then an old man and dying, do these transformations really take place? Or should I rather locate myself, who I am, somewhere else? Here, as I was saying, we find the beginning of metaphysics. It begins from this rebellion against the, the, observant, the observation that things seem to contain a nothingness within them, from a, a hope, at least, that nothingness does not exist, that things are always already safe and stable in their existence. And it proceeds as a philosophical inquiry. How does it proceed? Well, it proceeds through an inquiry which, if we said it using a Greek term, we would say skepsis. We say today skepticism. Skepticism in antiquity, of course, was different from skepticism today. First of all, skepticism today appears to be a European um, approach, you know, the skepticism of Hume, for example. But in antiquity, it was very much not a European approach. It was an Indian approach. The very origin of the term <clears throat> comes from the expedition of Alexander the Great all the way to India. When he traveled there, he brought with himself a number of philosophers, and one of them, Pirro, had the opportunity of speaking with the local philosophers of India, the gymnosophists, the naked sages, the Brahmins. In uh, ancient Greek culture, nakedness is not a sign of debasement of savagery. Nakedness is a sign of heroism and divinity. If you look at Greek statues, when you see them naked, it means that they have a heroic or divine quality. So the gymnosophists, these divine sages, taught Piero the art of being sceptical. Not being sceptical about opinions, simply. That was an old idea, Plato already discussed that, Socrates and many others. 
but being skeptical about one's own sense perceptions. We being skeptical about the most fundamental perception that we have, that when we look around, we see existence. And when we look around again, we see nothingness. How can we be skeptical about this basic fact <laughs> that we look around and there is reality? We look at ourselves and we see ourselves. Can this be false? Well, we just have to proceed slowly, but easily. We understand, of course, that when I look at objects around myself, they seem external to me, but in fact, this spectacle of this room or of your room is happening within my eyes, not outside of my eyes. This projection is happening inside. I'm here touching my, my face and my brain, of course, because for today we, we think that this projection appears and happens in the brain. If we had done this conversation in ancient Egypt, for example, I would have done this or this. The stomach and the heart were all the places believed to be the place of this projection. When we hear, this hearing happens in my ears. When I taste, the taste happens in my tongue. When I touch, the touch happens in my fingers, and so on and so forth. So the reality that appears external to me, if I try to investigate for a moment where I am experiencing it, I realize that I'm not experiencing it outside of myself. I am experiencing it inside. So what, I, what can I say of this spectacle that I look around and I see this existence, this reality? Hmm. Well, I can no longer say that it exists outside of myself. I can no longer talk about it as an object, something external, stable and fixed. This reality, as I see it, this ordered world made of time passing, space distributed, objects separate, identities and so on and so forth, well, this cosmos, this ordered world, is happening within me. So what is happening outside of me? Well, this is a problem, of course. I cannot say, we cannot say what is happening outside of us. We cannot say what is reality. We cannot even say if the very idea of existence and of reality apply to what is happening outside of our mind. We could believe, of course, that for some incredible miracle and coincidence, this mystery, which is reality, this infinite universe in which we live, infinitely expanded, perhaps, infinitely old, well, that for some crazy reason, it was created or built or happened to exist precisely to coincide with the way in which we perceive it, with the way in which we think. That the universe was somehow created to coincide perfectly with the limits that we have in perception and understanding. That our ideas about reality, that our idea that this object is a glass, that is made of glass, uh, that exists in this moment in time and so on and so forth, somehow perfectly coincide with what actually happened outside of our mind. We could believe this, but this would be a very wild assumption. It is infinitesimally small, the probability that the universe coincides perfectly with our means of understanding. So what we can do is we can hold judgment. And this is precisely what was told by the gymnosophists, the naked sages, heroic divine sages of India, to Pirro, who then came back to Greece after the end of the Alexander the Great's expedition, and started its own school, which then became known as the School of Skepticism. One of the fundamental ideas of this school is that reality as it is, is unknowable, and thus we must hold judgment, withhold, suspend judgment when asked about anything, because the truth about anything is beyond our ability of discovering it. Now, this is all very well, but how do we live? <laughs> if we are to suspend judgment about reality, how do we live? The risk, of course, is that by suspending judgment and saying that what we see around ourselves is just an illusion, well, this illusion will start to disintegrate and behind it, 
we'll see the forces of chaos coming onto us. In some psychopathological experiences and psychotic attacks, it happens to have the experience of chaos closing in, the world literally disintegrating. Cosmos, order, disintegrating, and chaos, disorder, arising. It is possible to live like this, but it's extremely painful and very hard. So we humans, I think, are justified by, on the one hand, suspending judgment on the true existence of things, but on the other hand, inventing a world, making cosmos, creating realities, saying that indeed there is such a thing as a glass, that indeed it's possible to call me with the same name that you called me when I was a boy, that boy who doesn't exist anymore, and, and so on and so forth. By doing this, by holding up these hypotheses, by naming things, by creating a catalogue of objects distinct, distinct only in our mind, not in reality, a catalogue of time distinct in moments, distinct only in our mind, and so on and so forth, well, we endow ourselves with a world. But a world which is not real, a world which is fictional, which is an hypothesis. Inside this hypothesis, we can live. The moment we forget that it is an hypothesis, the moment we believe that what we see through our eyes, through our mind, through the machines that we have invented, well, that that is reality, then at that moment, well, we make a bad philosophical mistake and we fall into superstition. So this is where metaphysics truly comes in. It is a way of understanding many of the aspects that we've just discussed. The very fact that there is something rather than nothing. The very idea of something and nothingness. Questioning them, accepting that there is a way in which things appear to us as a phenomenon, as something that appears, and understanding this phenomenon. All these parts are part of metaphysics. What is the use of metaphysics? Well, it's Huge, of course. And it has to do with literally everything. I was describing <clears throat> that a world is fundamentally an hypothesis, a way in which we create a fiction around ourselves. We endow ourselves with a world and we live in this world. Some elements of this fiction are somehow uh, necessary. For example, as human beings, we do seem to require the fiction of space and the fiction of time in order to navigate our life. But even the fiction of space and of time, which seem to be biologically bound to us, don't always work in the same way. We don't need to kind of um, always use the same variation of this fiction of space and fiction of time. Different civilizations in different moments in history and in different parts of the world have elaborated this idea of space and time very differently. Let's think, for example, of the ancient Greeks, like the ancient Indians, who believed that time was cyclical. Let's believe, think of us today, who believe that time is linear, and many other possibilities about the existence of time. Mm -hmm. So we can modify our fiction about reality. We can somehow invent different types of fiction, and we have invented many different types of fiction having to do with the nature of reality. Each of them, each hypothesis about reality, each metaphysical system, gives rise to a different world. <clears throat> so that, for example, if we were medieval peasants living in the north of France in the 12th century, what we would witness around ourselves, based on a very different metaphysical hypothesis from that which we have today, would have been a physically different world, an actually different world, populated by different objects, angels, souls, God's plan, going in a different direction, actually a different landscape where, to, where we can live. And thus, our life would have been entirely different because in a different landscape, different things are possible, different things are impossible. Different things make sense or don't make sense. So by modifying the hypothesis that we hold in order to give endow ourselves with the world, we are not only you know, playing with worlds, it's not just an academic uh, abstract pursuit, 
but we are truly modifying the world where we live, the field of what is possible, impossible, reasonable, and superstitious. So we are modifying the game board over which the game of life can take place. If we look at big transformations in history, this is often how civilizations move into one another, how history changes and really flips over. History progresses through many types of changes having to do with socioeconomic systems and so on and so forth, but fundamentally the great epochal changes have to do with the transformation of the metaphysical hypothesis that people hold in order to create world and to live. Think once again about the passage between medieval Christianity, Europe, and contemporary scientific technic world. Two entirely different universes where entirely different things make sense. And that's why when we look at the ancients, we are in a foreign land. And often also when we encounter different people from different parts of the world, we truly encounter other worlds. And sometimes the conversation between different worlds is particularly difficult. So, Operating on philosophy and especially operating on metaphysics means operating on the background of every other aspect of life. Politics, first of all. Political systems and political discourses are entirely transformed depending on how we decide to make world. For example, we can decide that the world is <clears throat> created, constituted by natural divisions. There is a natural division between humans and non-humans. There is a natural division between male and female. This is an hypothesis. And for a long time, Europe has existed on the basis of this hypothesis, has endorsed this hypothesis, and this was the European world. But we can also decide, as we are currently doing more and more, that there is no natural distinction between humans and non-humans. There is no natural distinction between male and female. And that's how our world is changing. Is either of these two hypotheses quintessentially true? They're all fictions. The absolute truth, as old Piero and the gymnosophists would tell us, the absolute truth is beyond our grasp. What we have is fictions. What we call them is worlds. And we often take them very seriously in order to be able to believe in them enough so that we can enjoy life without feeling the experience of chaos, without thauma coming back too much to haunt us with its horror. But Thauma does come back to haunt us with its awe and with its horror. And it is, I think, the second return of Thauma, or third return, if you like. We had it witnessing existence, witnessing death and transformation, but here again it returns. After we have dealt with it by creating fictions, when we, are, when we sometimes are reminded of the fact that these are fictions. And that everything that we think and believe fundamentally is a fiction. Beautiful, ordered, a cosmos, necessary, but not true. <clears throat> Included in this idea of fiction, there are precisely those things that give origin to the feeling of Thauma. We said that Thauma comes from the experience of existence and from the experience of death and disintegration. But aren't these two notions, existence, life, nothingness, death, themselves fictions that we have invented to endow ourselves with a way of making sense of the avalanche of perceptions that invest us and creating an ordered world? Yes, they are. So what can we say about existence, fundamentally? What we can say about existence, well, leads us to the very edge of metaphysics, beyond the edge. Heidegger would say that beyond the edge of metaphysics, there is poetry. But other very great metaphysicians, such as Ibn Arabi, um, a great Sufi thinker of the medieval time, who lived in Spain, and indeed is one of the greatest European philosophers who ever lived. Of course, being of Arabic language and Muslim, you will never find him, unfortunately and stupidly, in, in seemingly any uh, handbook of European philosophy, but he still is one of the greatest European philosophers. Ibn Arabi would say that beyond metaphysics, there is ineffable silence. 
ineffable silence. And here we are already starting to understand how we can move in this voyage to the limits of our mind beyond the limits of our mind. Ineffable silence <clears throat> means that there is a moment in which not only we decide to withhold our judgment and to not say the absolute truth about things, <clears throat> not only we decide to and take on our fictions as the fictions, but we start to contemplate and to realize that indeed there is a limit to reality which is defined by the limit of our language, as Wittgenstein remarked, the limits of a language are the limit of a world, and beyond these limits, we cannot say there is nothingness. We cannot say that what exceeds the grasp of our language, what exceeds the grasp of our making world, of our mind, of our perceptions, of our cognition, of our language in any form, but that it does not exist. That it is nothingness. It is something beyond existence to a certain extent, in that it, is, it exceeds the linguistic concept of existence. But it is not nothingness. Once again, it is possible that it might be nothingness, but it would take an incredibly unlikely coincidence that the limits of our mind and our understanding specifically of such notions, which are culturally specific, such as existence and nothingness, perfectly coincide with the actual architecture of the entire universe and of reality. It would be very superstitious and very arrogant to believe that that is the case. So, more modestly, more philosophically, we have to say that it is not nothingness. It's something beyond the distinctions of language, beyond existence, beyond nothingness. And what we start doing then is we start creating a geography of reality that exceeds the world. There is the world, which is what we create around ourselves by ordering linguistically our perceptions, the raw perceptions that we have, by creating something made of distinct objects and so on and so forth. And then there is a beyond. <clears throat> and this beyond exists or is there, whatever we want to use, a provisional term to indicate it, in a way that exceeds the limits of our language. It is not nothingness. But a couple of aspects here to keep in mind. So beyond our world, there is. I cannot say what, we cannot say what, but there is somehow. And we can look at it only negatively, as if through an inverted mirror. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we can say of it only that we cannot say anything of it. This is the only thing that we can say of it. This is an old method called negative theology. He was very popular in late antiquity and in the Middle Ages, in the Islamic, Christian and Jewish world, so especially in the, in the Mediterranean area. <clears throat> One of the main uh, proponents of this, of the earliest proponents also of this method, was a pseudonymous author called Dionysius the Aeropagite, who was a person who wrote in late antiquity but pretending to be a character from the time of Jesus Christ. And it is one method. We can start mapping reality on the basis of our limits by negating our limits. So one of our limits is language. We refuse to limit reality to our limit of language. We say that beyond it, there is not language. There is something that does not exist, but does not not exist. It's not not nothing, and so on and so forth. This spiraling of negations becomes vertiginous, of course, because we are really getting to the limit point of our imagination. And we can proceed, if we wish, in our mapping of reality beyond the world, once again by looking at how it reflects on us, how we can approach it. We can approach it negatively, and then we get, of course, the idea of ineffability, a dim dimension of reality that exceeds language. And then we can continue by proceeding beyond with the idea that there might be a negation even of that, the not-not, the infinite knots until we get to the very limits of our imagination and beyond those limits once again we cannot say anything and we, when we realize that when we think and we imagine things even beyond our world we always proceed by couples, by relations. 
we proceed by relations in the world. <coughs> Sorry. We proceed by relations in the world. When we look around ourselves, we understand objects in their relation with each other. Mm? The chair ends the moment that the floor begins, for example. I end the moment when there is not me, and so on. But then reality is extended all the way to the limit of relation and then beyond. There is a beyond even to the limits of our imagination. There is a beyond even to not being, to not existence. And even of that, we cannot say that it does not exist entirely, that it is nothingness. <clears throat> so you see that metaphysics le leads us very far, very close, it furnishes us with the world, and very far to the very limits of our imagination. It also helps us to establish a bridge between the very close and the very far. And here, I think, is where artists in particular arrive. What I've been describing is an idea of reality that is not monodimensional, that doesn't have only one dimension. We often, in our everyday dealings with things, we take for granted what we see is what we get. So it's, this is it. Around ourselves, look, reality. We have seen that, of course, it doesn't prove nothing. So it's not only one dimension, the dimension of langu language, perceptions, cognition, but it is made of many more dimensions that negate our and exceed our limits all the way to the excess of our, the, the limits of our imagination. In this multidimensional reality, anything that we see, this glass, for example, can be said to be only in part within one dimension. This glass is what I can witness of this according to my sense perceptions, to my cognition, to yours, to the limits of our mind, of our imagination, and so on. But is it everything that there is to this? No, we cannot say. <clears throat> Actually, we should assume, indeed, that unless by a miracle the limits of our mind are the limits of reality, which are very different from the limits of the world, as we saw, or this glass exists simultaneously on this dimension, the world, and many other dimensions beyond the world. <clears throat> How can we establish a link between these dimensions? And why should we? Well, one reason why we should is because not only this glass is befallen by the fate of existing simultaneously in multiple dimensions, but also this, also me, also you, each single existent is not limited by the very narrow understanding of existence that we humans have, biologically and culturally in this particular civilization. Each single existent exceeds these limits infinitely. This means this glass, and this means me. Me as this body, me as my mind, me as what the ancients used to call the suke, the soul or the, the Indians called the Atman, consciousness, the awareness, however you want to call it. <clears throat> Artists, I think, are especially good. Philosophers are good sometimes at inventing some architectural systems, very abstract, but artists are very good at creating the actual imaginal infrastructure that allows us to comprehend these architectures in one you know, vision, and to move through it. We humans, we, we work through images, through fictions, visual fictions as well. And artists have always been important in allowing people to understand metaphysical systems to their limits and beyond the limits of metaphysics. <clears throat> One example, the great medieval painter of icons, Andrei Rublev. Andrei Rublev was a painter of icons in Russian Christianity. So it means in a form of Christianity where icons are not simply uh, images or devotional objects, but they are sacred images. They are the actual image of the divine. Of course, they don't believe that it is the actual image of a divine. The divine is limited to that image, but that image is truly the window through which we can look beyond 
reality, into the divine, into the ineffable, basically, into what is beyond the world. Andrei Rublev was said to be the greatest because, and this is a comment by an art historian and many other things called Pavel Florensky, one of the greatest art historians, philosophers, mathematicians, and many other things of the 20th century. And he said that Andrei Rublev was the greatest because he was a painter and a saint. And he said, only a painter can be a saint, and only a saint can be a painter. Because in order to describe the dimensions beyond the world, it is necessary to have experienced them somehow, to have seen them. Hence, the saint, the one that sees. But then once you have seen them, in order to truly be a saint, a bodhisattva, would say a Mahayana Buddhist. So somebody who doesn't lose themselves mystically into the nothing, into the beyond existence, the divine, but who comes back with an element of compassion and helps everyone else to exceed the limits of the world, well then you have to return and describe it. And the what best way to describe it than to paint it. So the only possible saint is the artist, the possible artist is the saint. With this, I would like to close my contribution um, to this public program by inviting also contemporary artists to consider that that work um, really has to do with metaphysical concerns in that it comes from a particular way of looking at the world, that it can be modified, this way of looking at the world, not only using hallucinogenics as is very fashionable to do nowadays, but also more modestly on, on any armchair or any bus ride by starting to transform the assumptions that we have, that we use to create worlds. Then that their work can truly contain an element of contemplation. So witnessing what is beyond the world, not just the weird and the eerie, as the much beloved Mark Fisher used to call them, but also the ineffable, what is beyond language beyond existence with a skeptical gaze towards what we think existence and language are moving beyond to the limits of our imagination and beyond the limits of our imagination suspending judgment on the truth but expressing oneself on the fact that we do not believe that our limits are the limits of reality the limits of our language are the limits of our world yes but the limits of the world are not the limits of reality and then trying to create a system of mirrors, a Jacob's Ladder, if you wish, a, a magic steed, like that which took Mohammed to the sky on that famous night, through which it is possible to travel through these dimensions. Many things will be discovered, I think, by doing this. One of the things, I think, and I will live, the, and I will live with this, is that it might be the case that it is not only us from this particular dimension of reality who are feeling thauma and who are feeling disquieted by the experience of seeing falling into the nothingness beyond language and who also might be convinced that there is no such thing as nothingness, that things never truly disappear, but that there might be also something beyond our world that equally is eager to encounter othernesses other worlds, namely our world for it. The communication between dimensions is truly interdimensional and art can truly create bridges, can be art for this world, allowing it to look at beyond the world, and art for the other world, allowing it to look into the world. Ancient art often did this. The Nazca lines, the, the, st the structure of Catholic churches in the shape of a cross, for example, hint to the, or the creation of um, statues to be inhabited by the gods in ancient Greece, hint to the fact that artists can create these bridges of communication not only for us to move beyond, but for the beyond to move and look in and to create a bridge of solidarity and of knowledge and of understanding between the dimensions of reality. Thank you so much for your patience and your time listening to me. And I wish you all the very best and to enjoy the exhibition of Damla Kirikiran. And I hope I will see you again soon, perhaps in Bergen or in London. Goodbye.